trained as ESL teachers. So we have those experiences as well as teachers, as well as librarians who've worked with international students. So all of those things um, went into this presentation. Um, I want to start with um, playing this video. It's a video of a student who worked with me several years ago. She's an international student from China. Um, at this time, she was a senior in uh, comparative literature. She's from China. And um, she worked with me on a number of projects for improving services for international students. This was a video that um, Lo Anthony Snavely made of her when she was working with us. For international students, especially when you're new, you're not going to want to talk too much and you're going to be very intimidated just by the thought of having to go up to somebody and talk to them in English and language you're not familiar with and or ask them a question. And oftentimes when I was first new here, the problem I run into is to find the exact right word to ask the exact question that I want to answer. It's, it's hard, but it's the only way to get, to get past that is to keep asking questions. Because there's no way you can understand. Because everyone has a certain way of asking questions. And in a different culture, it's not just the language. In a different culture, in Pennsylvania, you probably ask questions differently from in, let's say, New York, or let's say, in Chicago. You won't get to know about those things or the specific phrases people use until you actually start talking to them. So just go ahead. There's no, they will not remember you. Well, the, if you ask them enough questions, they, they will. But no one's going to come back 10 years later and say, oh, she used the wrong place there. I did not understand her for 10 minutes. It doesn't matter. The, the thing that matters is how you learn. So, um, and librarians are just so friendly. I mean, Pennsylvanians are very friendly. But librarians are extra. Extra, extremely friendly. So just go up to them and um, they want to make friends with them. Very, very useful, actually. And we've shown this video at the international student orientation that we do. Um, and some of the things I like about this video is um, Yancy, you can see she's, and just from with working with her, um, I could see that she's very bicultural. Um, and it's true of a lot of international students. There's a wide range of experiences among our international students. You know, some of them are fluent in English. Some of them are multilingual. Um, you know, some of them have lived abroad or in the U.S. Um, already. So um, she's an example of, of a student who I would think of as bicultural. She's very American in many ways, but she also um, has her own culture and her own language. Um, this is some uh, general information about international students in higher education. Um, the numbers for international students have been going up um, over the past uh, number of years. It's uh, over 800,000 that's total in higher education that's the, from 2013. That was the most recent um, uh, I could get. And it's, been, it's increased 7%. Um, the largest sending countries, you can imagine, if you work in this library, <laughs> you see a lot of Chinese students. That's the largest group. Um, India, South Korea, and uh, Saudi Arabia. And I just looked at this in uh, recently. I thought it was interesting that there's been quite uh, an increase in students from Saudi Arabia just in the past few years. Uh, so that that's something uh, new that we're seeing. Um, and this is some of the, uh, uh, the numbers for Penn State. Um, almost 8,000 students. Now from 2013, that's a, that's a record high as well. Most of them are at University Park, although there are international students at many of the campuses as well. Um, there's more undergraduate students than graduate, and that's been a change. When I first came here um, eight years ago, there were many more grad students. By, by far more grad students who were international students. So that's been a change. Um, and our numbers are similar to the uh, national trends. Um, fourth, Ch China is the largest sending country by far. Um, and that just keeps increasing and, and increasing. 
um, South Korea, India, Taiwan, and Saudi Arabia. I mean, it's only 193 students, doesn't seem like that many, but that is still at the top of the list. And in the classes that I teach, the ESL classes, I'm, I'm seeing more and more students from Saudi Arabia. So that, that's been an interesting change. Um, so in addition to the Penn State students, who are international students, um, there's some other groups that we may see here in the libraries. Um, the Intensive English Communication Program is here on campus. I taught in that program years ago. Um, those are students who are here uh, preparing for study in the U.S. So they're here specifically to take English classes, get the experience of being in the U.S. They're not uh, matriculated Penn State students. So they're not in a degree program. They're just here as part of um, this um, intensive English program. And there's generally 100 or so, 150 of those students. Um, international scholars, um, we have, um, for 2012 is the latest information I could find. Uh, but there are you know, over a thousand. Those are um, scholars who are here for maybe a, a few months, a semester, a year. Um, and we might see people from the community who are often spouses or families of international students and faculty. So I, I wanted to just point this out because these may be people who we see who have not had the chance to practice their English. Um, this may be their first time in the U.S. They may not really know much English um, at all. They don't have to pass a test the way our Penn, the Penn State students do. Um, but we may see them in the library. Um, so these are some of the things that we're going to talk about that um, may help you with communicating with international students. Um, how you speak. Your style and rate of speech um, can have an effect on you know, how you communicate. Um, the use of idioms and jargon. Um, cultural references that students may not be familiar with if they didn't grow up here. Um, how to be an effective listener. Um, Amy's going to talk about cultural differences um, and those kinds of things that we can be aware of. And of course, for all of us who work in any kind of customer service, Positive attitude is always important, of course. Um, just feel free to jump in at any time if you have any questions. Um, I did some uh, research on this. I've often heard when I've been to um, workshops like this or in articles that I've read that the first recommendation is, well, you should speak slowly if you're speaking to someone. Um, whose first language is not English, but research actually shows that speaking slowly does not help. <laughs> it can even make it worse because you can imagine if I were speaking very slowly right now, it might seem kind of condescending. <laughs> and also, um, it might just make it harder for you to understand me. Um, so it's um, recommended in, in some of the literature to speak at your normal rate, uh, but to pause maybe more often than you usually would to let what you've said sink in so that students who are processing things in a second language have the time to process that information. Um, you don't need to simplify your grammar. I'm sure nobody here would do that. You know, the me, Tarzan, you, Jane kind of thing. <laughs> um, that doesn't help. Um, and it's really more a matter of speaking clearly. If you feel like somebody is not understanding you, um, speaking clearly rather than slowly. Um, and this is an example that I've heard from so many students that I've wor worked with, ESL students. Um, and it's an example of how you might articulate something more clearly. Um, students say they're, all, they're asking a restaurant about a soup or salad, and they're wondering what is a soup or salad, but of course the server is saying soup or salad. So that's just something to keep in mind, and an example of how you can say something more clearly but not more slowly. Which I have heard some, um, my students have said, you know, it seems condescending if somebody's speaking slowly. Or as Amy was telling me about her husband speaks slowly and loudly. It feels like she's not getting it. <laughs> and um, idioms are, the definition of an idiom is like a phrase that can't be, the meaning can't be inferred from the individual words. Like the classic example is, 
kick the bucket, uh, but we were saying that's probably not a phrase you're going to use at your service desk, but um, just an example, if, there, if you were trying to understand that phrase literally, it, it doesn't mean anything. And there's many other examples of that that um, you can probably think of. And students and friends that I've had who've lived here for years and speak very good English, there's these idioms that they just may not know, they've never come across. So it's just a matter of being aware of those kinds of things. And if the student looks puzzled, maybe you need to explain the, if you've used an idiom. And there may be idioms that you would use when you're at a service desk. Probably not kick the bucket, but <laughs> some of these other things that you may not be aware of, that um, it's just not something the student has come across. I, I have a friend from Israel who's lived in the United States for for years, years and years and years. But he asked me about the expression dog-eared. He had never heard that before. He said, what is this dog-eared? So, <laughs> um, and he's been here more than 20 years. Um, these are, this is like my word cloud of library jargon. Um, so even our native speaking students may not know what we're talking about if we're, <laughs> when we're using some of these uh, expressions. We, we probably wouldn't use authority control in, in conversations unless you're talking to like a cataloger. But um, they may seem obvious to us, but like the word abstract has multiple meanings. That could be confusing. I don't know if I have it on here, but like the word journal in French means newspaper. And in English, it doesn't mean newspaper. <laughs> so um, things like that, words can, these words can have multiple meanings. They may just be something that's completely uh, new to the student. So um, like circulation, I think is confusing to many students. Um, we would probably say the checkout desk or the service desk or something rather than, because that, again, it's a word that has multiple meanings. Um, when, it, when I did this presentation before, somebody asked me, well, what should we say instead? So there is a resource from ACRL. It, there's, they've created a multilingual glossary of library terms. Um, it's a language table with library terms in other languages. And there's also definitions of library terms in English. So um, that's the very, very long URL. But this um, presentation will be posted, right, Rita? So, um, you can go to it and you can go um, to some of these sources that we have in here. And, and we've um, listed some of the articles and things that we've used in preparing the presentation that you can, you can get from the slideshow. So that's a really great resource um, for the student and maybe for us as well if we're, as we're helping students. Um, there's some Cultural references that we use, it's a little bit different than idioms, but you may not even be aware of how often we use baseball language when we're speaking. I'm not a sports fan. I don't watch sports, but you know, I grew up with baseball. I'm sure I've used these things <laughs> myself. And in the ESL classes that I've taught, students don't know, they know nothing about baseball. You may assume, well, everybody knows about baseball from American TV, um, but they don't. And it can be very puzzling. <laughs> um, and when I did this presentation before, somebody mentioned uh, poker and poker language that we use. And there may be other kinds of references that you might use um, that the student might not be familiar with. Like the example I thought of was, we're not in Kansas anymore. You hear Americans say that, that it may be familiar to a student, but it may not be. So my suggestion is to just be aware of these things. And if you are speaking with somebody who it appears that English is not their first language, then um, you might want to uh, just avoid these expressions. Or if they look puzzled, maybe explain it. And they will probably enjoy hearing your explanation and learning something new. Uh, but you know, if you're at, at your desk, you're in a hurry, you want to help the student, you know, that's something to just keep in mind, too. We don't need to simplify our language, but we may want to avoid using these kinds of references. Um, and there's been some research, a lot of research done on listening. 
particularly listening to people who speak with an accent. Um, and oftentimes, you know, you'll hear somebody say, oh, she had such a heavy accent. But to somebody else, they may not hear it as a heavy accent. It's really, it's kind of a matter of interpretation. Your ability to understand accents does improve with exposure to that accent and to accents. In general, I've worked with ESL students, international students, and I, I have gotten better at it um, just from that exposure. And if someone who has an accent, it doesn't mean they're unintelligible. They could be speaking perfect, perfect English as far as grammar, but with an accent because as um, adults, when we learn a second language, we tend to keep our accent. Our children who learn a second language, they tend to, um, they, they adopt, they are able to adopt the, the accent of uh, the language, but as adults, we, we lose that ability for various reasons. Um, so if you feel like you're having trouble understanding somebody, you do probably what you're doing right now. You're not listening to every word I'm saying you're listening for like what we would call the gist. And you're not listening to the individual sounds because you don't need to. Um, but sometimes when we hear somebody speaking with an accent, you get very focused on the sounds that they're making rather than on the meaning. Um, and there, there have been studies, I don't know if it's this one that I referenced here, where um, the participants in the study listen to a recording of someone speaking um, and some of the words were obscured with like a sound. So some of the some of the words were unintelligible. It did not affect their ability to understand it at all. The listeners were able to understand it even though they didn't get every word. So that's um, just an example that you don't need to understand every word. Any any questions? And I would never hesitate to ask a student to repeat something or to write it down. If, if you just feel like you're just not getting it, what they're saying. Um, or sometimes if students are in my, one of my classes, I'll ask another student to help me understand. And then, they'll, then maybe the other student will be able to understand, even though they're speaking English. But the, the way they're pronouncing it is, is I'm, not, I'm, just, I'm not getting it. And I would always say, you know, I'm having trouble understanding you. I wouldn't put it on them. You, you, you speak with a heavy accent. I'm, we put it on me. I'm having trouble understanding. Um, so again, I'm Amy. I'm a colleague of Dawn. I uh, work in library learning services, but most of my career was working with international students. Um, and so when Dawn asked if I wanted to chip it, uh, to add to the presentation, um, for me, the really important thing to talk about was empathizing with them. Um, so in, in addition to being sensitive to language differences and using effective listening and speaking techniques, um, both myself and the library literature talk a lot about uh, being empathetic toward our international patrons. And Dawn, as we were planning this presentation, uh, Dawn wisely pointed out to me that empathy is actually in, I guess, the most recent version of our strategic plan. Um, so I'll just read what's in there to you. It says, in our role as service-oriented information professionals, we value an understanding of the unique characteristics of all people and strive for insight into what others are thinking and feeling as we work with them. This helps us understand how users react to our services and enables us to have more thoughtful, and respectful interaction. Um, so this is all well and good, be empathetic, but how exactly can we be empathetic? Um, and I think in order to cultivate empathy for international students, it's important to try to put yourself in their shoes. In fact, that, that's the difference between empathy and sympathy. You know, sympathy is just trying to understand another person's position. Empathy is like really trying to imagine what it's like to be them. And so what I'm going to talk about are some of the cult, um, cultural barriers or difficulties that international students face while, while they are here. 
Um, and specifically, I'm going to talk about something called culture shock, um, the different expectations they may have of libraries based on their home countries, and also just general stressors due to living abroad, operating in a new context. Okay. So culture shock. Are any of you familiar with culture shock? I know Dawn is. Have you lived abroad? No, but you yeah, just familiar with the concept. The concept, yeah. Well, my rough definition of it is the period of intense disorientation is one attempt to adjust to a new culture. Um, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Panama, so it's something I've been through several times. Uh, it typically appears after like three or four months after you've been in a country, and it can occur multiple times. Um, it's very normal. It doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with a student if they're going through culture shock. Pretty much everyone who lives abroad goes through it. Um, some of the symptoms are you suddenly realize that all of the written and unwritten rules of your home culture just don't seem to apply anymore. Uh, like, for example, in our country, it's very important to show up on time. If we say we're going to meet someone at 10 o'clock, we show up at 10 o'clock. It's not like that. Ever. Um, and that's one thing that personally bothered me. I remember when I was living abroad, I was in a um, Latino country where people tend to arrive a little bit later to things, it's just how they do it. And I remember it took a long time to get used to that. Um, something else that new culture may make, uh, may seem to just not make sense. You're like, why are people acting this way? And my personal example of that, um, when I was going through culture shock, uh, again, I was in a Latino country in Panama, and every time something bad happened to me, my neighbors would just start laughing. I mean, they would just fall down laughing. Like one example is I am um, kind of silly, but I had this yoga mat that I had gone through great lengths to, to bring back to Panama after a brief trip to the US, and my neighbor's dog ate it. and. Uh, and for me, it was just like the worst thing ever at the moment. Um, but yeah, all my neighbors just started you know, almost crying, laughing at me. And I remember thinking, like, this is so rude. But that's just how, in that culture, what I came to realize, in that culture, that's how they cope um, with difficult situations. That's just what they do. Um, another thing that can happen is you can start, if you're going through culture shock, you can start to romanticize your home culture and things like, oh, back in my country, everything is perfect. And in this country, ugh, oh, they lose people. They just can't get anything right. And it, um, how can I explain this? It's a very normal thing to go through, as awful as it sounds, and it does go away. But it is a very normal part of culture shock to go through this period where you're romanticizing your home culture um, and thinking like this new culture, oh, it's, just, it's awful. Um, and finally, it can even cause a high level of anxiety, even paranoid behavior. Um, so again, it's a very normal process, but it can be quite stressful for a student going through culture shock. All right, another thing that uh, international students are going through is they may just have very different conceptions of what libraries are and what librarians do. Uh, so I have a number of examples, both gleaned from the literature and also from my former international students. Um, one is that a lot of libraries worldwide don't allow browsing. They have closed stacks. So the idea of going up to a bookshelf and just grabbing a book may be completely foreign. Um, technology can vary widely. Uh, some students may be from countries where libraries aren't even equipped with technology. Or they may have great technology, but just completely different discovery systems than we have. Borrowing, uh, being able to take a book out of the library might be new. Customer service expectations may be very different. And I think a lot of this is related to what is considered polite in different cultures. Um, like, for example, in some countries, it's important to stand very close when you're talking. Um, other cultures, it's important not to stand close. Uh, 
And so my advice on that is just to kind of follow the student's lead. You know, if a student is stepping toward you, they want to talk more closely, you know, just go with it. If they step back, respect that as well. And finally, the whole idea of a library, not just as a place to get information, but also as a place to study, might be very new to them. And then beyond that, beyond culture shock, beyond um, dealing with these differing expectations of libraries, they may just be under a lot of stress. And there's a number of um, number of places that the stress may come from. One is they might just be purely exhausted. Um, anyone who has uh, spoken a foreign language abroad knows it, is, it just takes so much of your brain capacity every day to constantly be decoding this other language and producing the second language. Um, you know, so some of the students you deal with at the service desk, I mean, they might just be at their wit's end exhausted. Um, they're also adjusting to a new academic environment. Just like libraries worldwide are different, um, academic you know, universities are very different worldwide in terms of academic expectations, how students are taught, um, things like that. Probably the most common complaint, um, though maybe not the most serious, but a common complaint you'll hear international uh, students and scholars talk about is dealing with our diet, just getting used to the type of food we eat. Um, again, seems like a trivial thing, but we all know how we feel when our stomach is not doing well. You know, it can affect our behavior. Um, this one, I think, is pretty telling. Some of these students are under enormous family pressure. And over the years, I had a number of students tell me that their entire extended family had pulled all of their money to send this student to the US to get an American degree so that they could get a good job and then send all that money back to the family. That's a lot of pressure to put on one you know, young person. So some of them are going through that. Um, and the stressor that I most relate to from my own experience abroad is um, when you're living in another country, it can be very, very lonely, especially if there is not anyone from your home country. Um, it can be very hard just to make friends. Like, I remember my experience um, was incredibly isolating because I was trying to make friends with women my age, and most of the women in that culture, in my town anyway, you know, had a lot of kids. They didn't really have time for this little American girl. Um, so keep that in mind, you know, when you see your international patrons, just, you know, give them an extra smile or a helping hand. Um, they could be going through some pretty tough times. And that is all I have. I'm going to hand it back to Dawn to talk about attitudes toward accent and speech. Thank you. Um, I put the Disney villains up here because these are all Disney villains that have an, a foreign accent. Although everyone else around them speaks with an American accent, although they're supposed to all be from uh, the same culture. So it's kind of an, an older um, thing that you see in cartoons and movies where the villain has an accent, not, not so much anymore, but particularly in cartoons, <laughs> um, it seems. Um, uh, to be a thing, and Aladdin is an example. The villain in Aladdin has an accent, some kind of unplaceable foreign accent, and Aladdin is like the boy next door. Aladdin is totally American. So um, there's a, a couple, uh, there's an article and an entire book uh, called English with an Accent that's all about all these kinds of things and um, the kind of um, discrimination and, and other kinds of experiences that, that people with accents have had um, just because of this kind of assumption uh, almost that there's something um, 
different about people with accents and maybe even you know some something bad. Um, so uh, that's this, uh, something to keep in mind. I'm sure nobody in here uh, thinks that way, but um, just um, you know when we're we're at our desks, I'm sure we all want to treat all of our patrons equally and you know with respect, no no matter where they come from. And you know, having a positive attitude uh, towards all of our patrons, um, and if we're we have a positive ad attitude towards somebody we're trying to help who's speaking with an accent, you know, to help it will help us be able to um, help them better. I think. Um, so these are just kind of a summary of some of the things that we talked about. Um, I point out about speaking at a normal rate and pausing. Um, and I found in my classes with uh, ESL students, it works really well where, where I will speak. And I walk around a lot when I teach, but then I'll stop talking <laughs> and walk around. And that gives them time to like, process what I've been saying. Um, avoid or explain idioms and cultural references, like kick the bucket. Um, and avoid assumptions about shared cultural knowledge, um, like assuming everybody knows what um, we're not in Kansas anymore means that, you know, don't assume that um, whoever you're helping will understand your baseball jargon. Um, and in listening, um, listen for meaning rather than sounds. You don't need to focus <coughs> on every sound. If you can get the meaning, um, it won't really matter if not every word is pronounced um, correctly or the way that they're, you're used to. Uh, and Amy talked about being sensitive to uh, the stress international students may be facing, being empathetic um, towards, I think, our students in general are often under a lot of stress just by being a student. And the international students have that much more um, added on to what they have to deal with every day. Um, and be aware of attitudes towards accented speech. Um, there have been studies done where people were played a recording of somebody with an accent. Um, and, and even um, uh, this was done with ESL teachers. And even ESL teachers, um, they had um, a kind of um, sort of preconceptions or um, prejudices even about people with certain kinds of accents. So um, that's just something to be aware of. Um, I think that is all uh, we had. Um, so we would like to take any of your questions or discussion, any um, examples or stories you have about experiences you've had yourself abroad or with students or patrons here where you came across a cross-cultural situation that you handled beautifully or that you felt like you maybe didn't handle so well. <laughs> we have a question online. Mm -hmm. gonna, can I just hit it? And you can see the question. Yeah, over the phone is really difficult. Um, Jennifer's question is, how could I better approach my misunderstanding of an accent over the phone? Um, and it, of course, you can't see the person um, when you're on the phone. Um, I think I, I would not be afraid to ask somebody to spell something. I mean, I don't, you know, I think if, if you do, like, what I try to do is to say, I'm having trouble understanding you. Sometimes I'll say, like, there's a lot of background noise here, which is often the case when I'm at the Knowledge Commons desk. Um, you can, um, I, I would not be hesitant to ask for me to spell something. Mm -hmm. And another, um, just to add to that, another technique is just to, it's called a recast, to repeat back what they said to you. You have to care, be careful, of course, not to be condescending. But just as you would, um, you know, with a native speaker, you might say, uh, so you're looking for a book called this, or so you're trying to find this article. Just casually repeat back to make sure you're on the same, same page. Um, I think that can reduce frustration for the international student, um, because that way they know at least what, what you do understand. Um, if you just say, I don't understand, they think that everything they said was bad. So, another technique.
Anybody in the room have a question while we're waiting for people to type in their questions? Or is there something you want to share from your own, own experience? It looks like people are typing questions. Well, a lot of the techniques you referenced today I mean, are, are useful across the board, regardless of the type of patron. Yeah. Like the Definitely. Yep. Listening, yep. The, and to repeat it back, um, a lot of those are really helpful. Yeah. I've always thought the training as an ESL teacher is just like really good training in teaching in general and in communicating. You know, a lot of our training is just in how to be clear, how to make sure your audience is getting what you are saying. Um, let's see. There's a comment. <laughs> oh, I can just bring it back. Yeah. Oh. Uh, Andrew says, gosh darn it. When I'm having trouble understanding a patron, I like to say, sorry, my ears have a thick Pittsburgh accent that usually sets them at ease. That's yeah, great. I love that. Yeah. Can help too. Well, yeah, and like I said, you're, you're putting it on uh, yourself rather than the patron. Like, I can't understand you. You have an accent. You know, um, if you're putting it on, uh, it's just saying, I'm having trouble hearing you, you know, or... Yeah. yeah. I, I like that. My ears have an accent. Um, from Alexandra, uh, how can I approach behaviors that are considered frustrating or rude in this U.S. culture? Cutting in line, interrupting, etc. Hmm, that's a good one. I think it's okay to point out to the patron that the behavior is rude. Maybe not in those words, maybe just saying, you know, in case you didn't know, we usually do things this way. Um, but just be sensitive to the fact that the international patron might not be trying to break the rules. It really might be a miscommunication. Um, so try to just give a friendly reminder rather than an admonition. That would be my point. Yeah, I think with cutting in line, I mean, that's just not a thing that we do here. That's not acceptable. So I think that you could explain that. I mean, you know, as a, as a child, we're taught that here, that you're not to do that. Um, with interrupting, it, that really is a cultural thing. Um, my husband works for a company um, that's based in Israel. He works with a lot of Israelis. And in their culture, if, if you're not interrupting, it means you're not engaged. You're not listening. You're not engaged. So. I would think that's just something to understand about certain cultures and, you know, um, just um, if they interrupt you, stop and wait and then continue. I mean, I would just kind of accept that as a cultural difference, whereas the cutting in line, it's just, you, you have to understand we don't do that. <laughs> that's, that's just rude. Um, so yeah, that's what I would say about, and like the personal space is another thing. Um, you know, if you're uncomfortable with it, I think you could say something. Yeah. You know, um, and if you you can say it like, you know, if this is what's acceptable here or what's considered, you know, how things are done without being sort of rude or condescending about it. Yeah. Yeah, I think the important thing is just to make clear that you're not trying to punish the student. You're just giving a friendly reminder. Uh, part of the presentation, you talked about avoiding culture, you know, the cultural because the, you know it doesn't communicate. But I found sometimes if you and the other and your patron share a similar cultural background that is totally off key. I'll use my example, Pokemon. You wouldn't believe like this. As soon as the student understands that you know what they're talking about, there you can actually switch into that shared cultural background and it promotes way better communication. Yeah. Because even mm -hmm. if you're like, they can't figure out the word, they can be like, oh, but in 
the show or the game, this happens, and you're like, oh, they mean this, and you can change mm -hmm. it around the same way. Because, yeah, we can't all use baseball references, no, no. but um, a student from Japan who's really into baseball, that could be a great jumping point for both of you together. Yeah, yeah I think any time you can make a connection with a patron, you know, whether they're an international student or not, it's going to make them feel more welcome here. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had students, students who are really excited to learn <coughs> like a new phrase or something. They're like, what does that mean? And I would explain it and they would be like, oh, cool, I'm going to use that. <laughs> <laughs> it's acceptable to ask a student what country they're from? I think so. I think most of them want to tell you. You know, they'll be excited that you're interested in them. I think um, if, if you're sure that they are from another country, that there was, I don't know if any of you were at the presentation or heard about the presentation that um, Dr. Su did on microaggressions. And he is um, Chinese American. And he said that he's often asked, where are you from? And he'll say, I'm from Portland, Oregon. And people will say, no, like originally, where are you from? Which he finds really kind of disturbing because he's an American. He grew up here. So, um, but um, if it, students generally do like to tell you where they're from. So I, I think if you ask where they're from and they say, you know, Pittsburgh, <laughs> just kind of leave it at that. But, yeah. yeah, you might want to wait to see if you hear a clear accent, you know, or other indicators that they're from abroad before asking, you know, what country they're from. And he's, Dr. Sue also said that he's been told, oh, you speak very good English. And then he's like, well, I grew up here. Why wouldn't I? And I've actually heard that from international students who've been told, oh, your English is really good. And they were kind of, I mean, they might have a bit of an accent, but they've maybe lived here for 10 or 20 years. And they, it's, they sort of feel like it's saying, well, of course, you're not American. Of course, you can't speak. English perfectly, so I'm surprised, and I, well, I'm complimenting you, or, you know, so you just have to be careful with things like that. Was there any other, I, I got all the comments on here, right? <laughs> yep. Thank you well, so thank much you for coming. Thank you so much for joining us and having this presentation for us. Um, I'm going to make this presentation uh, recorded. The link will be sent out through email. And you'll also be getting a survey to tell us, give us some feedback and let us know what you're looking for in future presentations. So thank you very much for joining us. And have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.